discussing little known facts about the Easter Vigil. We spent four weeks discussing Holy Thursday, Good Friday, the Easter Vigil, and Easter <coughs> Sunday. Now that we're in the middle of the Easter octave, rather than jumping into another theme, we're going to spend one more week talking about Easter, but this time some little known facts that maybe you haven't learned before. We'll see. First, uh, the, the uh, source for this is a book called the Triduum Sourcebook. This is a series of books that we as priests have for various seasons of the year, for Advent, for Lent, for Easter, etc. And so this pulls from a, a book called the Triduum Sourcebook. Should we take a look at page one? Page one shows us, interestingly, when we talk about our Easter Vigil service, we know that the Easter Vigil, the foundation of the Easter Vigil service is, the, is the, the Word of God. We have an extended liturgy of the Word for the Easter, for the, uh, Easter Vigil. So I have here six columns from pages 80 and 81 of that Triduum source book. And it has in those six columns, Roman, Middle Ages to 1965, Roman Gregorian, Roman current, Lutheran book of worship, book of common prayer, and Byzantine tradition. Before we jump into those, let's make sure that we're understanding those. Of those six, which did we use for the Easter vigil this year? Roman current. Roman current. Roman. So we follow the Roman lectionary. And so the third column, Roman current, shows the scriptures that we had for our Easter vigil. Going back in time, Roman Middle Ages to 1965 would be what, if we grew up prior to 1965, what we might remember. Pre-Vatican II. So we had a lectionary pre-Vatican II that was uh, from the Middle Ages. And prior to that, we had a Gregorian lectionary, if you will, a Gregorian missal that we followed that had various scriptures. You can see it had very few for the Easter Vigil. So those are from the Roman, from the Western tradition that we enjoy as, as Catholics. But then on the right-hand side, we have three other columns. The Lutheran Book of Worship would be used by whom? Lutheran. Lutherans. We have the Book of Common Prayer, the BCP for short. Book of Common Prayer would be used by whom? Anglicans. Anglicans and Episcopalians. So the Anglican and Episcopal Church. The, the Anglican Church is largely in England. When it came to the United States, it's often referred to as the Episcopal Church church especially the more progressive parts of it so that's the book of common prayer and the last one the byzantine tradition is an eastern, eastern church Orthodox. is an eastern church so what do we notice about these six columns for the scriptures that we used roman current what do we notice uh, are there any scriptures that all of them have in common Genesis, all six traditions exodus do we follow our eyes across? Do we see that? How it is that all of our Christian traditions, we all begin with which with which account? The creation story from Genesis. And what did we say is the other reading that we never do not use, that we always use, uh, that we cannot uh, skip? Which one is that? That's Exodus. Exodus. Why? Because Exodus is what all of our traditions has in common, and it sets the uh, the stage for the, the Paschal mystery. Christ passing from death to life was prefigured in Moses and the people of the Israelites passing from slavery into freedom. So what we notice is that in the Gregorian lectionary, in the Gregorian sacramentary, there were very few readings. And then after that, it kind of went overboard could you imagine going to an Easter vigil service that was pre-1965 to see all of the readings that are in the first column? Jeez. But for them, prior to the Second Vatican Council, it was making a night of it, mm -hmm. right? Everyone settle in. We're going to be here a while. And then we have others we can see in the Lutheran Book of Worship and the Common Book of Prayer, etc., how it is that different Christian traditions use different scriptures for the Easter Vigil. Anything else that we see as we as we <clears throat> run our eyes over those two pay, th those uh, six columns of scriptures? If not, have you ever read the Canterbury Tales? Ooh, think back to like sophomore English, or maybe you had like a 
British literature. Before, before contemporary English, we had Old English and then Middle English. If you flip over to page two, we have an example of 14th century early English. Ooh. When you start reading some of these words and how they're spelled, do you think that we can understand some of it? Shall we take a look at it? See if you can understand what I'm trying to read here. Christa's people, oh, Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Christa's people, this is, this is old English. This is kind of cool. Both men and women, as y'all know and well, these day, this day is called in some place Easter day, and in some place Passe day, Passover, right? And in some place, Goddess Sunday. It is called Easter Day for well nigh in. A place. It is the manner this day for to do fire out of the hall at the Easter. And okay, let's just admit there's a little. <laughs> difficult to read this old English. But what's fascinating is that we get an old English account of the service of fire mm -hmm. that's being that, that's being employed in the 14th century, but now translated. Now someone in English, which is a new language, a new Germanic language, that they're trying to articulate what it is that they are trying to do in Easter. In the, se in the third full paragraph, this day is also called Passa Day. That is in English, the passing day. Huh. And God's child shall pass out of the evil living into good living, out of vice into virtues, out of pride into meekness, out of covetousness into largesse, out of wrath into mercy, out of gluttony into abstinence, etc. Fascinating look. Just thought I would share that. And then the final one. Uh, final paragraph, this day is called Godness Sunday for Christ, God's Son of Heaven. This day rose from death to life, and so gladdeth all his servants and friends. And if you want your head to hurt a little before going to bed this evening, you might try translating all of this old English into contemporary English. Um, uh, simply a glance into an Old English text, probably one of our earliest Old English texts dealing with the Easter rite. Enough of that? On to the next page. Now it starts getting interesting. This, as it shows at the bottom, is something that Hippolytus wrote in the third century in a work called the Apostolic Tradition. Third century, that would be the 200s. So if we're talking in the 200s, we're talking roughly two to three hundred years after the, the Christ events. This is what was happening. Hippolytus says, the water, and he's talking about the Easter vigil. What, how are we going to baptize at Easter? The water is to be water flowing from a fountain or running water. This rule is to be observed except when impossible. You may remember sometimes in Holy Family in the past, we've put like a, what do you call it? Those things that you put into aquarium, like an aquarium pump, so that the water is like flowing as well, because there's something in the scriptures about the symbol of flowing water. The, wait a minute. What's the second paragraph say? The candidates are to... Remove, remove their clothes. clothes. So you have to understand that in the ancient church, men were baptized in one place by male priests. Women were baptized in another place by women priests. This may strike us as odd. And the whole, uh, we, we're, we're accustomed to seeing uh, people clothed in white at baptisms. Where does that tradition come from? Because after you were baptized, you were clothed in white but you were not baptized wearing white. It doesn't make sense for you to be baptized wearing white. In the ancient, the ancient church, the symbolism was that you are baptized and then you put on white clothes. Hippolytus in the third century, which is the 200s AD, is telling us how they did baptisms. 
The children are to be baptized first. All of them who can are to give answer for themselves. If they cannot, let their parents or someone in the family answer for them, which is essentially what we do at infant baptisms, right? Let no one go down into the water without anything of, with anything of the stranger, with anything of the stranger. Don't go down into the water with anything that you didn't come into this world with. The priest will take aside each of those who are to receive baptism. He will order each to turn to the West and to make abjuration in these words. I renounce you, Satan, and all your undertakings and all your works. For the sake of demonstration, this direction is East. This direction is West. Why do we face West when we talk to Satan? And in what direction do we face when we talk to Christ? What direction do we face when we talk to Christ? We face East, the rising sun, right? We believe the Christians, the, the many ancient cultures believed that their gods would come from the East like the rising sun, which is why we were buried. Go to Oakwood Cemetery, you'll see all of the tombstones leaning toward the East. Why is that? Because we buried people so that their faces were looking right. East. And when the, we put the stone at their head and when the ground started to settle, the stones, it looked like they're facing East. Really, they're just collapsing into the ground as it settles. But all of us were facing, we were buried facing east so that we were lying facing the rising sun. Is that, is that tradition still? <laughs> is that tradition still? For tombstones uh, to be facing east? It's not. Okay. But it's a beautiful thing. There is an expression when it comes to celebrating the Mass, ad orientum. Have you heard of that before? Ad orientum simply means that Father Jamie, instead of facing you, the Lord be with you, is going to celebrate Mass with his back to you. Have you seen priests who celebrate like that? They celebrate with their back to the people? Seems kind of rude. Where does that come from? This tradition of everyone facing the East. That's all faced toward the East. So Father Jamie is not facing us like the presence of Christ in our midst. Instead, Father Jamie is going to turn in the same direction as us, and we're all facing east. In this case, we'll be facing this direction. So typically, in the ancient church, churches were built so that the altar was such that we would all be facing east during the celebration, ad orientum. So if we're facing Christ in this direction, then where was Satan imagined to be? In the direction of the setting sun and of darkness in the west. <clears throat> So, please. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I would have thought that maybe the East, because, you know, Jesus on the right hand of God, you know, it would make more sense, right? Try that one more time. Okay, so you said um, that it should be facing East whenever you're, you know, preaching about Jesus or, you know. There you go. Right. So wouldn't it be like, make more sense if it was on the, we're doing it that way because Jesus is the right hand of God? Yeah, if you're definitely if you're facing north, then the east is on your right. There's something interesting about that. Though, if we were to take that in the other direction, if God is straight ahead of us, though, and if Jesus is sitting at God's right hand, then where is Jesus? Yeah. But there's something about for the ancient Christians in, in a world before compasses or anything, all they had was the sun. They knew that that generally was east. And that that generally where the sunset was west, more or less, east and the west. And so we as Christians, we, when we gathered for sunrise, for our sunrise service, we were facing the rising sun. We were watching the sunrise together as we celebrated Mass. And then what was behind us was symbolic of darkness. The light coming into the world, the darkness being scattered. So when, what Hippolytus is telling us in the third century is, when we talk to Satan during the creed, when we say, do you, do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his empty promises, all, all that we say during the Easter Vigil? What direction did the ancient church face? Okay, let's all turn to the back of the church. Hmm. After this abjuration, the priest anoints them with the oil of exorcism, saying, let every evil spirit depart from you. A deacon descends into the water with the one to be baptized. The one doing the baptizing lays his or her hands on the person and asks, do you believe in God? And of course, they go into the traditional creed of the church. 
even in cremation, uh, my parents are placed in peace. There you go. Uh, uh, even they set it up like that. Uh, Facing the rising sun. Yeah. The light of the world. After this, the priest will anoint the person after they've professed the faith. The one being baptized is the answer, I believe, then is baptized the third time. So essentially, back then it wasn't, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It was the deacon going down into the water with the person and essentially asking them, do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? The person says, I believe. Let him baptize the person a first time keeping his hand on the head of the one being baptized. But when they say baptize him the first time, it doesn't mean pour water over his head. What were they doing? It was baptism by immersion. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born by the Virgin, by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, who's crucified on Pontius Pilate, who died, was raised on the third day, lived, living from among the dead, who ascended into heaven, who comes to judge the living and the dead? The person says, I believe. And what happens? Plunge under water a second time. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church and the resurrection of the flesh? I believe. I believe. And that's how you were baptized in the third century without any white clothes on. <laughs> After this, the priest will anoint the person with the oil of thanksgiving. He will say, I anoint you with the oil that has been sanctified in the name of Jesus Christ. After drying themselves off, they will put their clothes on again and enter the church. After that, there is a description of the anointing of the newly baptized and then a long paragraph on the Eucharist at the vigil as well. Any words or thoughts that come to mind as we hear Hippolytus speaking in the third century of Easter baptisms? The translated English is so much better than the Canterbury one. Than the old English? Mm -hmm. It's easier to read. Did you, well, I don't know if anybody else knows this, but um, you mentioned, you mentioned before about how numbers uh, are something in the Bible. Sy symbolic. Symbolic. Yeah. Um, so I saw here that it's three questions that they, that they asked yeah. on here. So I know that three and seven, right? Yeah. And another number. Yeah. So. We tend to do the same. Did you hear at the Easter vigil? There were three questions renouncing Satan. Do you renounce Satan, the father of dark and the, the father of sin and the prince of darkness etc to reject all of satan's works and empty promises there were three questions that had to do with satan and then after that i do i do i do then there are three i do i do i do's about what you believe do you believe in god the father almighty the maker of heaven and earth i do do you believe in jesus christ i do do you believe in the holy spirit the holy catholic church community of saints i do wow so there's something about the symbolism yeah what are the differences between like the what is it the Holy oil, holy oil in the Lord and the exorcism oil. Yeah. Uh, the oils that we, did you know today that we have three holy oils? If you go over into the chapel, there are three containers of holy oils. What are those three holy oils? They're marked S, C, O, I, and O, C. Because what we're hearing Hippolytus say is that they're using two different types of oils in the third century. So maybe they're not necessarily two types of oils, because if you go into the chapel, you're going to notice that they're all the same oil. But one of them, the sacred chrism, is used for certain sacraments like baptism and confirmation and uh, the uh, ordination, sacred Prism, S-C, O-I, oil of the infirm, the sick. When we go to anoint someone in the hospital or someone what, during our healing services here, when we celebrate the sacrament of anointing, we use O-I, the oil of the infirm. And the O-C is the oil of catechumens, which is what Hippolytus is referring to in that first anointing. So you were anointed twice, Kennedy. once before you were baptized, and then once after you were baptized. In many places though, to shorten the rite and simply 
it's not always clear to people why we're anointing twice. And so, for instance, in the rite that we often use here at Holy Family, we don't use the oil of catechism. You could, according to the rite of the church, it says to anoint the child on its, uh, on its chest, on its breast. So it's just pastorally, it's a little more difficult to effect and it, it, it's a little, the symbol, is, the symbol isn't, isn't as clear as anointing on the forehead with sacred chrism, receive the Holy Spirit. And the bishop blesses the oil? Mm -hmm. uh, all of these oils are blessed during the chrism mass, which is typically on the Tuesday of Holy Week or the Thursday of Holy Week. The chrism mass is the special mass in which those oils are blessed for the year. Is the oil of infirm uh, used for the dying? Yes. Yep. One of the ways in which we distinguish the various uh, orders of the church, we know that there are various <laughs> ordained ministries. There are bishops who, of course, are the only ones who can, can ordain. There are priests who can do a number of sacraments, including a mass, celebrating the Eucharist, then confession. There are deacons who can celebrate some sacraments like marriage and baptism. So in order to distinguish them, the sacrament of anointing is not performed by deacons. The sacrament of anointing is performed by bishops and priests, which is why you notice that our anointing services, it's the, the priests who step forward at that moment in the liturgy. But the deacons do baptize and anoint. Father, yes. I just have a quick question Please. since I, I never asked this before. Uh -huh. What's the difference between a bishop and an archbishop? Uh, so archbishops are typically over other bishops. So if you have various bishops, that's my attempt at bishops with mitres here. In, in hierarchical structures, then the question becomes, you know, who's going to be the head of these bishops? So they lump them under an archbishop. We've heard of various people using the title of archbishop before, which really does not make sense unless you have other bishops. In the case of Archbishop Allen, for instance, he's in a jurisdiction with some probably six or eight other bishops. So the term archbishop gives that sense of one being over other bishops. In the past, we've known other archbishops who have no bishops under them. And in that case, it's meaningless. Why, why, why would one have the title archbishop if you're not working with any other bishops. It seems a strange thing. Ready for the next page? That was Hippolytus speaking about the third century church and how they did things then. Oh, now we're coming to the renunciation of the devil again. I love this. Casimir Kucharek speaks about how it is that the renunciation of the devil must be adopted in all the churches, must have been adopted in all the churches prior to Nicaea. When was Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea? That was in 325. So according to his scholarship, before 325, it seems that the universal church had a right of renouncing Satan before professing the faith. Before we profess the faith, first, Let's turn to the West and renounce Satan before we turn back to the East and profess our faith in God. The North African church in Tertullian's day had the formula, I renounce the devil, his pomp, and his angels. Ambrose's church in Milan had the candidate renounce, using words, the devil and his works, the world, its luxuries and pleasures in Gaul, modern day France, the renunciation included the words, the devil, the world and sin. So in, in, in various places, people re, were renouncing things before they were professing their belief in, in other things. It just seems like they're given not homage, homage <clears throat> to the devil, but they're given the devil a big part of their service. They're given the devil a lot of power. Those are probably the words that I like least. As, as a priest, I love what I do. I think what I love least is having to say the word as if that that devil, that reification of evil that it is. We've talked about reifications before. Thingifications. When you thingify something, we thingify evil as the devil. And so before we 
profess our faith, we have this ancient, ancient tradition and this ancient belief in demons and devils that we renounce prior to turning to the East and professing our faith. The renunciation was very personal. Satan is addressed directly as if he were present and visible. He is defied to his face by having the candidate face the West during the renunciation, a custom apparently universal by the fourth century. In many places where, ha where hands were outstretched toward the West, toward the devil, as though he were present himself. In some churches, the candidates were even made to spit toward the West. Whoa. So they took this, they took this very seriously, right? This was an age before modern science. I mean, imagine for a moment, I mean, just the messages to children and persons of all ages being present. Okay, let's all turn to the West to get, let's turn to the back of the church and renounce Satan together. Okay, now let's spit together. Oof, that poor person, I just spit on the back of their head. Right? But it was their symbolic way of renouncing Satan. The Orthodox liturgy for our Eastern siblings at the bottom of the page. The priest turns the person to face the West, unclad, in plain English, naked, naked, unshod, no shoes, and having hands uplifted. Do you renounce Satan and all his angels and all his works and, and, and all his service and all his pride? Have you renounced Satan? Breathe and spit upon him. The priest then turns the person to face the east with hands lowered. Do you unite yourself to Christ? Have you united yourself to Christ? Do you believe in him? I believe in him as king and as God. So we're seeing that even in the Orthodox liturgy. The next one is two pages long, so we just uh, look to see who it's by. Cyril of Jerusalem in the fourth century wrote these two pages of words. Cyril of Jerusalem begins, Dear and true children of the church, I have long desired to instruct you in these spiritual and heavenly mysteries of the church so that you may know the work that has been done in you on this evening of your baptism. Cyril of Jerusalem is instructing folks on the sacrament of baptism. First, you entered the vestibule of the baptistry and standing there, you listened while facing the west. Then they bade you raise your hand and you renounce Satan as if he were actually present. Just as the tyrant pursued the people of old as far as to see this shame, impudent, impudent demon, the source of all evil, pursues you as far as the fountain of salvation. The tyrant was submerged in the sea. The demon disappears in the waters of salvation. That is why you were ordered to raise your hand and say to Satan as if he were actually present, I renounce you, Satan. What did you say then, each of you, as you stood there? You said, I renounce you, Satan, wicked and cruel tyrant. And you asserted, henceforth, I am no longer in your power. And it goes on where the person is talking to Satan. When you renounce Satan, you break off every agreement you have entered into with him, every covenant you have established with hell. Then there opens to you the paradise which God planted in the east and from which disobedience expelled our first parents. Then they ask you to declare yourself, I believe in the Father, in the Son, in the Holy Spirit, and in a single baptism of repentance. Cyril continues, draw strength from the words you spoke and be watchful for, as we have just read, your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Next paragraph is a brief one. As soon as you entered the baptistry, the baptismal font, the place where the baptismal font is, you stripped off your tunic. This rite signified the stripping off of the old self with all its activities. So there's something beautiful about the symbolism here, right? By taking off my, my old clothes, it's like me getting rid of the old self, going down into the waters of baptism, being made new, and then I put on a white garment. Stripped of your garments, you were naked and thus resembled Christ on the cross. 
There, by his nakedness, Christ deposited the principalities and powers, and by means of the wood, dragged them after him in his triumphal procession. Last paragraph. Stripped of your garments, you were anointed from the crown of your head to your feet with the oil of exorcism. Here you became a sharer in the true olive tree and grafted onto the true olive tree. And therefore you share in the anointing that the true olive tree bestows. The ancient rites of the church. That was the fourth century, which would be in plain English to the 300s. By 325, all these churches were facing the West and renouncing Satan. And in the fourth century, we see their baptismal rite. 1600 centuries, 16 centuries ago. 1,600 years ago. Joe? But I'm going back to something earlier. The bishop here is going to build a new Catholic church in Round Rock. Is this supposed to face a certain direction? For the ancient church, it was. For the ancient church, the church always, we always stood so that the altar was toward the east. Nowadays, architects don't keep that in mind. <clears throat> there is a beautiful symbolism there. Oh no! So, we, I know that your vision for the church, our future church, hopefully soon before we all die. Um, <laughs> I know that it, it didn't you want it facing in towards the east? But it depends on the property. So, you know, as, at any time. Anytime we go to a place, we'd have to look at the property and figure out, okay, where is where is the road at? You know, does that mean that we're going to somehow like be entering on the other side? You know, we have to figure out, you know, where's the parking lot go? Where does the church go? When, when architects and planners start laying out properties, you know, it's trying to figure out, okay, can a church fit facing the east on this property, or is that just going to be a little too difficult? Some properties it could work. Some properties, it may be a little more difficult. And so the ancient church did that. The question would be outside of this room and those who are watching us on video, you know, how many would be aware of this? How many of us go to a church? How many of us actually, any church that you visit, how many of us go to that church and say, huh, this is facing east? Or, wait a minute, this is not facing east. Examples? Santa Julia, facing east or no? no. Cristo Rey, facing east or no? Yes. Huh. But was it because they actually were intentional about these things or not? Or was it because of where those churches were located? Oh, here we are on Tillery Street. Okay, are we going to turn the church around? You know, so it's, a lot of it just has to do with working with concrete properties and, 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 and saying to ourselves, you know, there are probably larger things than the consideration of which way this church is facing. But the ancient church, it was important. Because every Sunday when we gathered, we faced the east. And so when we started getting into buildings, it was natural for us to say, hey, we face the east. We always face the east. Our churches have to face east. All of us are facing toward the east, ad orientum, all of us. Now, I have a feeling we could celebrate mass anywhere. We could celebrate mass here in this room with me facing north. I could go to the other side of the room. We could celebrate mass with me facing south. So long as there's no objection. Wait, my father, you can't do that. So you can't say mass facing the road. Thank you. No, just uh, you know the things that people thought of at that time. I was thinking, I'm thinking of the churches I've been to, like Guadalupe is facing east, yeah. correct? And then I was thinking of Saint Peter's. I'm not there you sure. go. There you go. Is it east? Yeah, that's east. Saint Mary Cathedral facing east. No, no, it's facing north. There you go. Wow. St. William Round Rock. I mean, we just go, go through various churches and think, okay, it'd be interesting to you know how many churches in the Roman Catholic Diocese of Austin were planned facing east, and how intentionally were they planned facing east, or was it just the fact that, oh, it's in this corner, so is it going to face east, or is it going to face south? There's a, uh, I don't know what, Austin or not, but there's a small Catholic church between here and Block or somewhere. And it was intentionally built to face the east or whatever. Okay. It would be interesting to know which one that is. I'm thinking of the old the old San Francisco Javier facing west. 
toward the devil. <laughs> I haven't seen the new San Francisco Javier. It would be interesting to know if some of these new churches that have been built, you know, were planned in such a way that they were facing east. Brother Jamie, uh, but uh, some people were baptized that were females, okay? Yep. And they had a, a priest, a female, right? And a female priest and a female deacon assisting in the women's baptistry. The men and the women were separate. The men did not see the women naked and vice versa. They had the men separate and the women separate. Yeah. So, but there was a priest, female. There were female priests until the fifth century. God. We're going backwards. <laughs> no, we are, we're going forwards. Uh, I mean, we are going uh, forward. Uh, the the, church, uh, the other churches church. are going backwards. Uh, where men I can report you. I'll call the Pope. <laughs> John Chrysostom, yeah. fifth century. Are we ready for, for the fifth century? We are facing west. Moving forward in time, we're on the second half of the page now. After that, John Chrysostom, fifth century. After that, as night approaches, oh yeah, I'm glad I'm not a priest at this century. The priest removes all your clothing, and as though meaning to introduce you to heaven itself through the things that are done, he prepares your whole body with an unction, an anointing of the spiritual oil so that all your members may be fortified by the unction, the anointing, and defended against the darts of the enemy. And the unction, the anointing, he makes you go down into the, after the unction, he makes you go down into the sacred water. So John Chrysostom gives us this image that what happened was we went into the baptistry, the priest took off your clothes and anointed you from head to toe before you went down into the waters. Next one, Casimir Kucharik. A threefold symbolism appears in taking off one's clothes, putting off the old person, as we spoke in old deeds, imitating Christ who died naked on the cross. Ooh, there's something beautiful about that, right? And Adam, naked in paradise without being ashamed. Aidan Kavanaugh, we won't read his words, but essentially he's talking about how it is that in the Eucharist, you know, we're so, as Christians and Catholics, we're always coming together for Eucharist, bread and wine, where the setting more resembles a dining room. Baptism for the ancient church more closely resembled, he says, a bathhouse, if you will, where people were bathed and cleansed. Last page. The Book of Common Prayer, there's something beautiful our Anglican and Episcopal sisters and brothers, siblings of the Anglican and Episcopal uh, churches, in addition to just these three renunciations of Satan and three the threefold profession in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, their profession of faith continues. And there's something so beautiful about this that I just wanted to include it here. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will, with God's help. Oh, so all of these are additional professions, but this is going to make them more relevant to our lives as, as believers, as mm -hmm. disciples. Will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord together? I will with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will, I will with God. God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I, I will, will with God's God. help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I, I will, will with God. God's help. The Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed on us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by his grace. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. There's just something beautiful about that, how they added five more questions to the traditional creed. Five, what an odd number, totally not a symbolic number, but they had five additional affirmations of how it is that as baptized people we're going to live our lives. It's not just about believing, it's about how we're going to live our lives now. It's more inclusive. Isn't it great? Mm -hmm. The last excerpt that I have is from a Roman Catholic priest whose name was 
Martin Luther. We've we heard of him before. The mm -hmm. Lutheran tradition is rooted in Martin Luther. The, the reason I like that is because you may not know Martin Luther wrote church songs. He wrote hymns. He wrote poetry and music. And so there are certain songs that we have today that were written by Father Martin Luther, a gifted musician. And this is one of the songs that he wrote. Christ Jesus lay in death strong bonds for our offenses given. But now at God's right hand, he stands and brings us light from heaven. Wherefore, let us joyful be and sing to God right thankfully loud songs of hallelujah, hallelujah. It was a strange and dreadful strife when life and death contended. The victory remained with life. The reign of death was ended. Stripped of power, no more he reigns. An empty form alone remains. His thing is lost forever. Hallelujah. So let us keep the festival whereto the Lord invites us. Christ is himself the joy of all, the sun that warms and lights us. By his grace he doth impart eternal sunshine to the heart. The night of sin is ended. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then let us feast this Easter day on the true bread of heaven. The word of grace hath purged away the old and wicked leaven. Christ alone our souls will feed. He is our meat and drink indeed. Faith lives upon no other. Hallelujah. I love that last paragraph only because after we have fasted for 40 days, what happens now? Now we feast for 40 days. Indeed, for 50 days until Pentecost. But we have that. 40 days before is Lent, 40 days after until the ascension of the Lord, plus the 10 days till Pentecost. We fasted, now we feast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can say the A word again. During Lent, we call it the A word. Now that it's Easter, we can say, Hallelujah. Questions or comments? I, I don't know about y'all, but there's something exciting about exploring the history of the church. What I like to think is that in this inclusive or independent Catholic tradition, it's not just repeating what's been handed to us, right, from those in the generation before us, but instead, it's, I was listening to an audio book today, which talks about how in order to go forward, you have to look back first, like, an, like a bow and arrow. Before you shoot the, the bow and arrow, you have to draw the arrow back before it goes forward. And so for us, as we go forward, we also look back. And when we look back at the rich history of the church, it's the church is much, is much richer in history than just the last 20, 40, 60, 100, 200, 300, 500 years. We have a 2,000 year tradition where, for instance, women served as priests and deacons, baptizing and offering the sacraments to other women. What we're doing here at Holy Family is nothing new. We are reclaiming the ancient traditions of the church. What the Roman Catholic Church is doing is new and novel, is an innovation. What is their justification? And that's why, and that's why the, the old Catholic Church referred to themselves as the old Catholic Church, because we're going back to the ancient church instead of all of these new innovations. The Pope infallible? We, the old Catholics said, you new Catholics have created a new religion in 1870 by declaring these things. That the Pope is the head of the universal church? That's never been a belief of the church. You have created a new church in 1870. We're going back to the old church. I'm going forward from there. Joe asks. Well, if I were in Argentina, it doesn't matter. Uh -huh. And I... We had a pretty organized bishops and priests and all that. And we just said, that's not right. Could we do that? <laughs> just say not accept. It, it's happening right now. You've got, you've got those in Germany who are starting to question, you know, but it's always been questioned after 1870, I think you mentioned, you know, as far as the why. Why do we have to do these things? You know, and then of course, if you even ask the question, then you are 
branded a heretic yeah. or a non-believer or whatever. We tend to do things because they've always been done a certain way. The story comes to the mind of a mother who is teaching her daughter how to make, what do you call it, a pot roast? And be, she told the daughter, before you put the pot roast in the pan, you have to cut off both ends of the pot roast. And the daughter asked, well, why do you have to cut off both ends of the pot roast? And the mother thought, you know, that's a good question. I'm going to ask my mother because my mother taught me to do this. And she asked her mother, she said, Mom, why did you teach me to cut off the both ends of the pot roast before putting it in the pan? And her mother said, that's a good question. We should ask your grandmother. Your grandmother is the one who taught me to do that. So they asked the grandmother, who is the, the little girl's great grandmother, why did you cut the ends off of the pot roast? She said, because when I was your age, our pan was only this big, so I had to cut the end <laughs> off of each end of the pot roast in order for it to fit. <laughs> and now, four years, four century, four generations later, they're continuing to do the same thing without thinking about, about what they're doing. There's something beautiful about us being in a tradition that is more critical. And just because we cut the pot roasts off, the ends off the pot roast last generation doesn't necessarily mean that we need to cut the ends off the pot roast this generation. Amen? Or we could. Or we can choose to cut the ends off the pot roast. I think there's a lot of things that may have happened that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well said. Mm -hmm. Last words? We'll buy a pot roast. Just make sure you have a good pen. <laughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and forever shall be, a world without